I'm here to talk about um, adapting to climate change in Scotland, um, a positive leg legacy for the historic environment. Uh, just a wee reminder, I think a lot of you will be f very fam familiar with Historic Environment Scotland now, um, but we are the lead public body for Scotland's historic environment. And our mission is to protect, conserve and manage the historic environment. And we have uh, 336 historic sites in our care um, from prehistoric monuments right through to medieval castles and so on. So that distribution map shows clearly that we have um, a huge ge geographical distribution for those sites that we look after, including a, a quite high proportion in the coastal zone and others very much affected by various climate change impacts. Uh, a wee reminder about why we do what we do. Um, there are very clear legislative and policy drivers uh, beyond the act, uh, uh, behind the activity that we do. Um, so under the Climate Change Scotland Act, we actually have formal responsibilities as a public body around mitigation, adaptation and sustainability. Um, so under adaptation, that we deliver programmes uh, for preparedness to the changing climate by planning to continue our function and increase resilience, and that we consider our, the impacts of climate change on current decisions and investments over future decades. So a very clear driver there, and uh, a couple of years after the Act uh, was passed in Parliament, there was guidance produced for public bodies on what that actually means in practice. So that's the document on the left there, which was published in 2011. Under the Climate Change Scotland Act, and in response to the UK Climate Change Risk Assessment, uh, we, Scotland produced Climate Ready Scotland's Scottish Climate Change Adaptation Programme. Now, we were involved in the development of that document and uh, submitted via building standards. So the adaptation measures that are in this document are quite historic buildings focused. Um, although they do include uh, things like and a commitment to carry out a climate change risk assessment on our own estate. Now, the new SCAP, uh, Scottish Climate Change Adaptation Programme, is actually uh, under development at the moment, and we've been heavily involved in that process too, and have uh, broadened our contributions, so it really does reflect the historic environment as a whole. So the public consultation on that's just closed, so we're looking forward to uh, seeing that uh, document uh, finally published. A lot of you may be familiar with our Climate Change Action Plan, uh, which is actually uh, formally finished now. It ran from 2012 to 2017. Uh, we have a new Climate Change and Environmental Action Plan uh, draft, which is just going out to consultation this week, any moment now. Um, but under the Climate Change Action Plan, the, the main thing is that we had a whole section on building resilience, effectively adaptation, so preparing the historic environment for climate change. And that includes a lot of the actions that are actually in the SCAP as well. Um, quick reminder for those who aren't familiar, since the 1960s there has been a measurable change in the climate in Scotland. So climate change is not something that's going to happen sometime in the future, it's something that we're already dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, the main headlines fewer days of frost this is since the 1960s, uh, fewer days of snow cover, uh, a much longer growing season, so around five weeks longer already. Um, already a uh, one degree Celsius rise in temperature, uh, over 20% more rainfall, um, and sea level has been rising at an average of three to four millimetres a year. So faster than elsewhere in the UK, and it's speeding up. This shows anticipated change by the 2050s. It's actually based on UK CPO9 data. Um, a lot of you will be familiar with uh, UK CP18, which was just launched last year. The main uh, headlines are that it, we're looking at warmer, wetter winters and hotter, drier summers. 
the sea level rise figure here is uh, a lot lower than the estimate that we see in the UK CP18. So there is quite significant change there. And we're looking at up to a metre higher sea level uh, by 2100. So within the lifetimes of children who are around just now. Uh, and you can see that things like um, increased precipitation uh, are already having an impact on our sites. Uh, this is Maze Howe in Orkney, which uh, shows a flooding event uh, a few years ago, which uh, obviously uh, had an impact on access to that site. Um, so I mentioned our uh, climate change risk assessment work. Uh, when we first started doing this work, we realised that we really didn't have a very uh, good understanding of the current uh, environmental risk from natural hazards um, on our properties. There had never been any kind of systematic assessment. So we looked for GIS data sets uh, that might help us and worked in partnership with the Scottish Environment Protection Agency and the British Geological Survey to pull together all the relevant data sets. Now, these are around uh, coastal erosion, ground instability, so landslides, and various kinds of flooding, fluvial, pluvial, coastal, and groundwater. And we basically carried out a vulnerability assessment as the first stage. So looked at those various uh, hazards and how they might impact on our estate. We looked, uh, we used a, um, a fairly straightforward uh, risk matrix for that. Uh, so looking at impact times likelihood, unfortunately don't have the detail to go into, uh, the, the time to go into the detail on this, uh, but uh, the report is uh, available free to download online. So the main assumption we were making that is that as climate change intensifies, uh, there will be increased uh, occurrence rates of the kind of natural hazard events that are represented by these data, uh, flooding, coastal erosion, and so on. So what we found was that uh, the majority, um, indeed uh, quite a large majority of our sites were exposed to um, a high or very high inherent risk uh, against these natural hazards. And when we modified those figures based on some variables that we thought might actually uh, reduce that risk, we still came out with the majority as being at high or very high risk. So we clearly have quite a significant issue. I think it's worth saying that a lot of the sites that we look after are in quite exposed locations yeah. and they were put there deliberately. They were put there because or, uh, they, were they were defensive or um, needed to take advantage of natural resources and so on. Um, so this is not, perhaps not that surprising, but um, it does show you the scale um, of uh, the potential adaptation that we might have to look into. This is a wee example uh, from this work showing Fort George, um, which is an 18th century fort up in uh, near Inverness um, and what you can see is that uh, in the map on uh, your left the uh, there are certain parts of the fort that seem to be um, particularly exposed to coastal erosion and that's quite interesting because it ties up with what we were already aware of on that site that bit in, at the north actually um, coincides with a sluice gate where there had been significant erosion uh, problems already. And a few years ago, Historic Scotland, as we were then, worked with the army um, to actually build some protection there, some rock armour to protect that side of the site. So I think it's quite important also to recognise that although perhaps in the past uh, decision makers haven't been that aware of the climate change issue, they have been reacting to these issues and uh, adapting in some cases. So another uh, project that I thought was important to mention was Edinburgh Adapts, 
uh, which is ongoing. Uh, this is this picture is from the launch a couple of years ago where uh, we had the Cabinet Secretary for um, Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform uh, launching uh, the vision and the action plan. This, had, this project has a huge number of partners and the idea was to actually develop a vision and an action plan for an adapted Edinburgh. So, uh, including all aspects of life and society in Edinburgh. So this is the first of its kind, although it is now starting to be copied elsewhere. So um, if it was really important to ensure that the historic environment was actually mainstreamed in that project uh, and recognised as not just a problem, but as part of the solution, which I think is the really important thing. Um, so we created, created a vision um, of an adapted Edinburgh, um, telling people what we thought Edinburgh might look like if, if it adapted as we thought it should. And then we uh, developed an action plan that actually showed how we would get to that stage. And we made sure that there were actions in there that were assigned to historic environment organisations. Uh, the majority of the historic environment actions were uh, assigned to ourselves and Edinburgh World Heritage. And uh, we have been working over the last year or so on uh, developing uh, guidance for homeowners and other property owners on how to adapt their historic buildings. So um, we that document that has now been um, put into a nice, friendly booklet, accessible booklet, um, which we will be distributing. That's uh, just recently gone to press, so we'll be launching that very shortly. Um, but that's quite a significant milestone for us uh, in raising awareness of adaptation. And I think the other thing is. Uh, the location of that launch is quite significant. That's Holyrood Park. Um, which is actually the biggest scheduled monument in Scotland. So um, I was really keen to have the launch at that venue in order to ensure that people got this message that ad adapting the natural environment and adapting the historic environment are two, aren't two completely separate things. They're all part of the same whole. Um, and you can actually work uh, with both together to ensure effective adaptation. So I think that's really important. And it's also been important for Dynamic Coast, uh, Scotland's coastal change assessment, uh, which Historic Environment Scotland has also been heavily involved in since its inception. So over the last few years, we've been looking at uh, historic data on coastal change maps, particularly looking at how the coast has changed over the last 130 years or so. Uh, this photo is from the launch of that stage of the work um, a year or so ago. So um, we got a much better understanding of which areas of the coast had um, changed um, over the last 100 years or so and by how much. Um, we have uh, since then been moving forward on the second phase of the project, which is pulling in lots of different data sets, uh, terrestrial laser scan data, LIDAR, aerial phot photographs and so on. So building up a really detailed picture. Um, and we've actually also projected forward. So using that historic data and fairly conservative estimates of rate, we've looked at what, what the areas might have significant change. However, they're quite conservative estimates um, and we're now uh, moving forward to quite a, to a much more nuanced approach um, using, as I say, various data sets, also satellite data. So um, that's an ongoing project and uh, I would definitely recommend that you go to dynamiccoast.com and have a look at that. Um, <laughs> We've been using Scara Bray in Orkney as a, a super site case study within Dynamic Coast. So uh, this is uh, my colleagues in the digital documentation team uh, carrying out a TLS survey recently. Uh, we've been doing monitoring at this site since 2010 on a biennial basis. So we now have a, a, an amazing uh, uh, documentation of, co of coastal change. 
And what we've been finding is that what's actually going on in the site is actually really quite complex and perhaps not doesn't match up exactly with people's perception of what's going on. So you can see in that um, image, this is comparing 2018 data to 2010 data, um, that we've actually got significant erosion and accretion um, in that site. And obviously the seawall there is affecting that. Um, the seawall is continuing to be maintained and augmented. There's very recently been brutal reinforcements gone in there. Um, so that's very much a, an ongoing dynamic uh, adaptation project. Um, this is the total reinforcement works uh, just very recently. Um, so that's a bit of um, a speedy run through of a few projects. Uh, there are more. Uh, but I, as I say, uh, Dynamic Host is definitely uh, worth your while. Uh, Dynamic Host is also now on Twitter, and there is actually an animation uh, of the Scara Bray uh, data just been uploaded to YouTube very recently. So definitely commend that to you as well. Um, and that's my contact details. So if anybody wants to talk to me about any of those projects, then please just um, let me know um, at some time today.